Hello, my name is Vanya Hollis. And in this lecture, I will be talking about teen space in the public library. Teen space in public libraries is an understudied aspect of library and information science. And when discussed, it's often relegated to talking about collections. Encouraging teen access to space in public places communicates powerfully their importance in society. Yet many libraries do not have adequate teen space. In this study, I, the Silver Lake branch of the Los Angeles Public Library was observed and it was uh, it made recommendations uh, for the improvement of their teen space. So as you can see here, here's the, the Silver Lake branch uh, of the Los Angeles Public Library. As you enter the space, you see immediately across from the entrance, there's a meeting room. To your right, which you see right here, uh, you see a small vestibule uh, with a display case. And then over here to the left, you see the stairs that lead up to the main space. Okay. Um, so as you head up those stairs, you enter the main space. The main space of the library houses the checkout counter over here to the to this area. And then over to one's uh, left will be the atrium where you see a lot of adults congregating or and studying. Uh, now, looking straight across, you'll see the information desk and to the right will be the children's area. And far back in the corner here is the teen area. It's a small space. It's not readily apparent. Um, it's tucked behind the adult stacks. The adult stacks are over here. And um, the sign above the space, uh, simply says teens, jovenes, and it's in silver lettering. And um, it's a little bit above one sight line. It's not readily apparent. Um, it's somewhat inconspicuous. And in general, like the rest of this branch, this teen space is quite small. It has a an area here of a wall of books. And uh, this is a YA fiction. And right over here is, y and is more YA fiction. And uh, so three walls of books here. And then on this side, you'll see some manga. So you have YA fiction here and then you have manga over here. All right. And then what you have uh, next to the manga is two more smaller shelves of uh, graphic novels. Okay. And so uh, the, the space appears pretty well maintained. The books are well maintained relatively new. Um, there's also a small um, area right here, a little cart with new books. All right. And um, that's, it's kind of at the opening to the space. Uh, there's really no evidence though of a YA specific uh, nonfiction collection. All right. Um, now the seating, let's talk about the, the seating here. Oh, here's the small uh, collection for teens, the, the, the new purchases, the, the cart, okay? Um, the furnishing and the arrange, uh, furnishings and the arrangement, the seating area for teens, um, you can see here that uh, it's somewhat small, it's meager. There are these three hard plastic seats. Uh, there's two beanbag chairs, a small little table, a colorful rug. Um, and then there's also this long, uh, table with, four, I believe there's four, you know, over here, there's one you can't see, but there's four computers. All right. And uh, there's also a small computer over here. Uh, I mean, sorry, a small table, a circular table, table right there. So this is the teen space, the, the area that you see. Um, and as far as, uh, as you can see, here's in the, the other end of the table. Um, as far as policies and rules, there were no rules or policies um, uh, posted anywhere. There was simply um, this one notice, which you could see here, right next to this little, this little, uh, this little notice right next to this uh, computer, and that talks about computer usage. So uh, computer usage is limited to two hours, and patrons are not allowed to use others' 
uh, other card, other people's cards. Uh, they're limited to using their own library cards and violation will can result in a patron being asked to leave under California penal code. So uh, that's the only thing that was observed um, as far as rules. Now I did look at the, uh, I looked at the website and saw nothing about the teen space rules. So there were really no policies or rules posted. Um, as far as age restrictions go, access, age restrictions, use of the space. So um, the really only indication that it was a teen space is this sign, um, as well as a few other signs, right? The teen info hub that you can see right there. Okay. Um, you can also see, you know, that's a little bit closer up where you can see it says teen hub. Um, right over here, you can see uh, teen volunteers wanted. Um, there it is a little bit closer, some literature for teens, et cetera. Um, so there, there definitely was an indication of this is a teen space. Uh, teens are supposed to be here. Um, in the elevator on the way up to the library, if you, if you took the elevator instead of the stairs, you could see it, it says programs for teens and that same poster is here as well as a coding club for six to 12th graders. So uh, on these flyers, it says that it's uh, for, this one says six to 12th graders. And then this one right here says uh, ages eight, sorry, ages 11 through 18. So those are really the only indications of uh, teens. Now, um, as far as use of the space, there were adults in the space, uh, two adults right here, um, both of which are regulars in the space, and then another adult over here that is off, off camera. There were no teens observed in the space. Now, as far as service point staff, uh, there was no teen librarian uh, working at the time of the visit. Uh, the only librarian that was there was at the person right here. You can see at the information desk behind this glass wall, a relic of COVID-19. So those are the observations of this space. Um, now I wanna talk for the rest of this lecture about recommendations for the teen space, okay? Um, so much of the literature on teens and young adults in public library spaces suggests that teens need and deserve their own dedicated space in the library. Um, having a, this space sends a message to them that they matter, right? Um, so Velazquez points out that space is power. Um, being in the public library is one of the only places where people are allowed to simply exist without paying for anything. There's, it's also a commercial free space. Um, this is really important for teenagers because they are young, they don't have an income. And so they need this kind of space in order to just simply exist. Now, there are many negative stereotypes of teens that exist in the media, um, librarians and you know, patrons, everyone pretty much absorbs these negative stereotypes. Um, and what this turns out to equal is this geography of no in libraries. And this is a term coined by uh, Bernier in 2003, um, this idea that, you know, there's, all, there's no talking, there's uh, no food, there's no sitting together in the same seat. Um, there's simply just a lot of no. There's not a lot of yeses, right? And so um, to compete, public libraries really need to become these, you know, a desired destination as Darren Rhodes point out, um, that uh, there's so many other things that teens can be doing, but they need to be able to uh, find a place where they can truly um, just exist and meet and congregate and socialize. Um, and in order to become this desired destination, these teen spaces and public libraries um, need to be increased. The space itself 
needs to be increased. So let's talk about the location in the of the teen space in the Silver Lake Public Library. So first of all, um, it is recommended uh, by Egoso et al that um, the physical young adult mm -hmm. space in the library be separated from the rest of the library to improve the YA atmosphere. Um, so it's not necessary to buy new furniture or completely rebuild the library. Um, one can use bookshelves and other furniture to demarcate the space. Um, so it, it, there's a need for rethinking the use of the space. Um, and it would behoove the Silver Lake Public Library to follow these recommendations. Now, um, as we saw in the picture, it is it is in its own little corner, but it is not, uh, it, it's really a small space, first of all, and it needs to be enlarged is, is a big recommendation. So uh, one option is to move down the uh, all of these bookshelves in the adult space. These are the adult space uh, right here that you see. Um, and there's a little bit of space over here at the end of those bookshelves. So move all those down and increase the space. That would only increase the space by a, a small amount though. All right. Um, so that's one small idea. Uh, another idea of rearranging the space is to repurpose, completely repurpose this atrium space. You hear this beautiful space where you can see outside. Uh, this was a raining day. Uh, you can see there's a piano right here. So there's a great space for performance. Um, there could be a lot of smaller, uh, you know, sort of shoulder height or waist high, I guess, shoulder height, probably uh, bookshelves around in this space. Um, this whole space could be the teen space. Now, as you see, there are a lot of adults using the space. And that is the primary, currently the pri primary clientele of the uh, of this library. So that may come uh, against some, uh, you know, some fire. People might not like that. So my third recommendation, um, it says here two, but it's actually number three, um, is to repurpose the meeting space on the ground floor. Turn this into a teen space. Now, it, you can't, you can barely kind of see here because I had to look through the cracks to take a picture of the space. The space is seldom used. Um, I have been in this library many times. It's near my home and I hardly ever see this space used. It's locked, it's closed. Um, and it's much larger than the current teen space. And what you can see here is that we could easily turn this whole space into a, a teen space. Um, so we could put uh, the, the bookshelves along the edge here, along the walls, maybe put some smaller ones throughout. There could be some uh, furniture that could be rearranged in different uh, patterns for, uh, for the, the teens to be able to move them around. Uh, this would be a great option. Okay. Um, one reason to do this is that um, it's away from the other part of the library, right? Um, this would allow the teens, right, who who love to socialize, you know, talk, listen to music, play games, create, interact. Um, this allows them to meet and simply be themselves, right, without any fear of retribution from the staff or from other patrons, right? Um, this could accommodate a large group of teens. This could accommodate a uh, programming for teens. Um, so, you know, this would really help fit YALSA's, you know, Young Adult Library Services Association's uh, recommendation that the size of the teen space should be, quote, based on community slash student population and not on existing teen use. Okay. So as you see here, um, I know right now that I, there weren't that many teens. As I said earlier, though, I didn't see teens in the teen space, right? Um, so teen use made it seem as though teens just don't use the library frequently. Uh, the visit was made at 4 p.m. on a Tuesday. So one would expect that teens would be there, but there were no teens in the whole library. Um, so, but the population in, in the local area is, is obviously much greater than zero. 
um, again, this would allow them space to socialize, right? To just be themselves. Um, their creations could be posted uh, on certain walls or could be uh, bulletin boards and, and spaces for them to, to you know, post their creations. Um, so uh, the, the other really great reason to use this space uh, as the teen space is that uh, it's right as, as I showed earlier, it's uh, just to the, the left of it is the stairs. So the, their creations could be put up on these walls. These walls are bare. There's an up in here too. It's pretty, it's bare. There's nothing really there. So the teens could put their artwork. They could create a mural. They could really create ownership of the space um, as well as over here, this vestibule is pretty underutilized. Um, these display cases have old historical information in them. It's not very interesting. Um, I've never seen anyone really just looking at that. The teens could put their artwork, their sculptures, their creations in this space. They could really take over this uh, vestibule space as well. And then a, another great reason that this would be a, an awesome space for teens is that it is right across from the entrance. So this is looking out onto the patio here. This patio would be a great space for teens to be able to uh, do performances. Here you see a, a rare rainy day in Los Angeles, um, but normally it's very temperate weather. There's This would easily be a wonderful space for people to be um, per doing performances, hanging out. And as one librarian uh, quoted in, in Bernier et al's research on um, on libraries and teen space in libraries, um, that they located their YA area to the front of the building as well. And they said they deliberately pushed for the YA area to face the street with the entrance. So since she said, quote, I feel that it is silly to hide your most active patrons in some out of the way corner of your building. I wanted teens to be able to drive by and see that the teen area was hopping, right? And so this is a, a great idea for the Silver Lake Public Library as well. Um, so the teens could come and go. It would be a great and exciting advertisement for the public library. Now, um, the if people who are upset about this, right, if uh, community groups, um, book clubs, you know, who normally use that meeting space um, are upset, then an easy fix would be for the public library, the, the Silver Lake Public Library to repurpose this silent study room. Now you can see here, uh, it says silent study room before the COVID pandemic, that room, it, this is on upstairs behind the information desk. So you can see right here, that room, the silent study room was used. People could reserve it to use it as a silent space. Um, but during the pandemic, the librarians took it over. It says staff only now. And they sort of took it over as sort of a, a just a workspace. But they do have adequate workspace behind the checkout counter. Um, so I believe that this could easily be repurposed to um, uh, be a, a great place for a meeting space um, where any groups uh, needing to use something like that. Um, now, it is really important to note teen only space um, doesn't equal segregation from others in the public library. So if the teens are moved downstairs to the meeting room um, and it becomes a teen only space as I believe it should, and uh, I will talk about that. Um, Teens should still be allowed to use all the library spaces. Um, it's really important to notice to note this um, because there's there's a lot of, of research on this around um, teens needing to be active citizens. They're empowered. They're they're leaders. In fact, um, Males noted in his research that um, teens are actually perhaps more equipped to be leaders in. Uh, our society because of all the skills that they are naturally learning as they um, grow up in this technologically enriched uh, world that we live in. And so um, 
we don't want to segregate the teens from the rest of the library, but it is important for them to go ahead and have their own space as well. Um, as far as furnishings and arrangement goes, um, there's a lot of research on, um, well, there's some research. Again, there's not adequate research on teen space and libraries, but the research that is out there is um, shows that uh, when teens are questioned, there is a, a constant reference to the idea that they need more comfortable seating with a variety of options. They want to be uh, able to lay down. They want to be able to sit, you know, two people in a seat. They want to be able to, to be close to the floor. Um, they want to be able to meet and socialize. Um, you know, as you see here in Howard's research, um, they said the single most desirable feature was a space to socialize. Um, so it's really important for that to be considered. Um, um, so when Bernier and Males did uh, their research, they they found that the type again the types of seating arrangements that uh, you know the majority of teens would like to see are couches, benches, um, seating close to the floor, beanbag chairs. Um, so it is recommended that the Silver Lake Library expand that right. And again, were they to move their teen space to this meeting room that I'm suggesting, that would be a lot easier because it's a lot bigger of a space than it currently is. Um, of course, uh, it is important to include teens in the decision-making. Um, have teens actually you know, choose the decor when possible, right? Have them pick out the beanbag chairs if possible. Um, another important factor to consider is including space for teen creations and, and you know, making the decor teen friendly. And again, including teens in that is one way to do that. Um, the, there is a, a, some thinking that has been done around the Nordic uh, for space model. Uh, Velasquez um, speaks of this a lot in her, in her book on teen space or on teen libraries. Um, and the idea being that teens need space. One, one idea of that four spaces is, is that teens need space to, um, to meet, to talk, to participate, to, um, to create. Um, and so having good seating would, would help with that. Um, all right. Now, um, talk about the collection. Um, collection itself is also an important part of the Nordic four space model because the collection can excite. That's one of the four spaces, um, an excitement and inspiration space. Um, and then it can also help them to learn, right? A learning space is another one of the four spaces. Um, and so how the collection is arranged is important as well. Um, so what one idea is dynamic shelving, um, which makes libraries look a little bit more like um, bookstores. And um, Kelsey Bogan, who is um, a professor and a school librarian, talks about this a lot. Um, Genrefication, of course, is another thing that is done a lot more in school libraries um, and less so in public libraries. But there is Howard, since 2011, um, in Howard's research, um, teens when they've been uh, interviewed have suggested that it would be a lot easier for them to find the kinds of books they're looking for if the, the collection was genrefied. So that will make it more appealing invite, and invite teens in. Of course, involving teens in the process is again, another important uh, recommendation. So that means that the teens can help uh, with the shelving. Maybe they can adopt a shelf. Right, um, and these would be the teens in maybe a teen council, for instance. They can adopt a shelf and help to make make it look creative and interesting. Um, they can make new displays. Um, you know, I didn't put that here, but uh, but displays and are, are something that can be helpful. Um, and one thing again, I didn't see at the Silver Lake Public Library was YA nonfiction. Um, and so Green uh, wrote an interesting article about how 
teens are really interested some teens are really interested in nonfiction. There's a lot of focus on fiction, YA fiction, but what about nonfiction? What about people's personal stories? Um, that is is a really interesting component of uh, the YA literature that's out there that, that wasn't included at the Silver Lake Public Library. So the teens, if they wanted to get uh, nonfiction, they either had to go to the children's collection, which you know most teens would not want to do, um, or they had to go over to the adult collection. And so um, it is recommended that they vastly improve their um, their nonfiction as well, um, which of course helps with learning. Um, and um, I also wanted to add that some teens, Sullivan um, in 2001 published an article about how, you know, some teens just simply, you know, prefer it, right? Um, they prefer nonfiction. So, all right. Now um, let's talk about policies and rules. Okay, so again, I did not see really any policies or rules um, when at the at the Silver Lake Public Library, and so it's recommended that some policies and rules be developed with teens. Right, they need to be involved in the process of this development. Um, so they need to create. Uh, a teen only space, right? And that should be part of the, the rules. Um, but the rules also need to be cognizant of teens need to socialize. So recognizing there was gonna be higher noise levels, there's gonna be music, there's gonna, sometimes there's gonna be food, there should be food allowed. Um, one, in, in, the, in some of the research that I read, um, I believe this was from Howard, but I may forget. Um, one teen said that, you know, there's no food at the library, food allowed at the library, um, but, people take the books home and read while they eat. So what's the difference, right? Um, we need to just respect that people, teens are human beings who need to eat and that, that makes, that's part of their sort of socializing life. Um, Bernier and Males do a, a great job of talking about how there's so much postural tyranny rules. Um, you know, the idea of, you know, one butt to a chair, right? Well, teens like to huddle up and look at their phones and, you know, look at some sort of technology or books sometimes, right? And talk and giggle and, you know, be close together. Um, so there should be none of these postural tyranny rules. Um, there was also interesting research um, done that uh, showed that as teens were more involved in the process of creating the rules, um, then there was less of a strict need to enforce those rules. And so uh, there's we need to recognize that, okay, we, we wanna create these rules, but uh, you know there may not need to be this strict enforcement, right? If the teens are included in the process. And um, that's, research was uh, was done by, sorry, um, Bernier et al. in, in 2014. Um, and so Bernier, of course, has done a lot of research on YA spaces. Um, also, um, you know, a lot of this stuff is coming also from the Young Adult uh, Library, Young Adult Library Services Association, YALSA, um, right? They have a whole uh, teen space guidelines that they put out in 2012. Um, so access, age restrictions, use of the space. Um, so again, as you saw, as you saw earlier, the adults like to use the space, right? This is uh, pretty common. Oh, I see a little problem here. This two A's. Sorry about that. Um, so uh, Bernie and I'll notice that adults often invade the YA space to take advantage of its features. Um, you know, in some public libraries, there's a lot more exciting features to take advantage of, but in this case, you see the features are simply the table space, right? Um, so they're able to sort of spread out and, you know, do their own thing, get comfortable. Um, so again, the recommendation here is to create a teen only space. Um, moving the teen space down to the meeting room would be a great way to do that, right? It has doors, right? You could post signs. It would be pretty easy to do that. Um, 
Now, understanding that people like to, you know, spread out, adults like to use a library, like to spread out. Um, another option, and this is mentioned by Velazquez um, in, in 2015 in her book, um, that uh, maybe it should just be, you know, if, the, if, if space is an issue, right, then um, just having these scheduled teen only times would be okay, right? So we want to create a teen only space or at a minimum, a scheduled teen only time, all right? Um, now, I do want to recognize that the uh, Silver Lake library has is trying right um we are coming back from a pandemic they are working on this uh teen council creating a teen council here so you can see it says um ages 11 to 18 right self-motivated teens um you know they would meet every four saturday right here you can see all right and so continuing that work will really uh, increase the use of the teen space, right? It will maybe lead to this idea of a teen only uh, or scheduled teen only space, right? So I wanna commend them for, uh, for doing that. Um, again, really important for teens to be a part of the process. Um, Augusto et al said that, uh, you know, teens appreciate their libraries, this is quote, teens appreciate their libraries, not just for the resources that they offer, but also for the activities and experiences that take place there, right? And so these teen councils are a great way to, you know, have activities, programming that, that really um, get teens involved, all right? Um, and as, uh, as a common adage, you know, form follows function, right? And so if you have great programming, then maybe the, sh the way the space looks will start to shift and, and adapt to that. Um, talking about the service point, the staff presence, right? So we noted that the librarian was sitting here behind this big wall, right? That even I was, you know, intimidated to approach. Um, and of course the teen librarian wasn't there the day that I went. Um, I do know her. I've I wanted to have a actually I asked her to for an interview, but she wasn't able to meet me at that exact time. Um, uh, but anyway, so it's important for the staff to be available to the teens. So rather than sitting behind the the desk, right, they need to be more present throughout the space, roaming rather than static, um, interacting with the teens, right? Um, that's a pretty important way to access teens. Teens can feel shy, right, with adults. They don't want to come up to the adults. So, um, you know, it's important to, to, to be out there, right? Um, and again, make, I want to commend the, the Silver Lake Public Library for these, uh, the Teen Council. Um, they also have a coding club that they're doing, right? And so this is because of the staff, right? And, um, and it's these kind of activities right, that um, are all important parts of the for the Nordic for space model that Velasquez talks about. Um, so, you know, they, they can uh, get inspired, get create, get, get to be creative, um, they can explore new ideas, they create, perform, participate, right? So this is one way to do that. So in conclusion, um, the Silver Lake Library really could benefit uh, from increasing its teen space and improving it, uh, making it teen only, at least some of the time. Um, again, I'd, I'd recommend moving the teen space to the meeting room, which is, as you can see here, this is the opening. The meeting room is right across from the entrance right there, right? Um, they can, in, they really need to work on their, their teen friendly seating arrangements. Um, you know, they can move things around to do that. Um, I know it would cost more to add, to buy couches or, you know, but but at least beanbag chairs, add some more of those, right? Um, they can improve the presentation of their collection, right? They need to involve teens more in their decision-making. And of course, um, continue the work that they're already doing, um, you know, in developing this teen council, as well as the coding club um, that they're doing. Um, so, um, this, if they do this, this really will communicate to teens, 
you know, not only the teens themselves, but also to the public, the importance of teen voice in decision-making um, about the use of public spaces. Um, you know, our young adults are our next, you know, tomorrow's leaders, right? As they say, um, they'll become more empowered and engaged and, and learn that their voice matters in our democracy, right? And um, this is where public libraries have a huge role that they can fulfill. So thank you for listening to my presentation. If you have more questions, you can always um, contact me. There's my email. And these are the references that I, uh, you know, used. You can see here are some more and here are some other ones. So for more information, of course, go and read these really great uh, articles. And thanks again. And um, thank you. That's it.